All right, so hello everyone and welcome to this session, Fact or Fiction, a session about media, messaging, and portrayal versus reality. Um, today during our session, we will have four presenters. Uh, we have Anastasia Browning, uh, Kenzie Hudler, uh, Peyton Lommers, and Carolyn Roderick uh, that will be presenting for us today. Um, and during their presentations, you in the audience have the opportunity to uh, send our panelists uh, questions that you have in relation to, uh, you know, the information that they're presenting. Um, and then at the end of our session, we will we'll have a Q&A time where um, you'll get to have those questions answered by our panelists. Um, and so again, uh, my name is Adam Hinckley. I am one of the moderators for today's session. Um, and I'm an academic and career uh, advisor in Tykeson College and Career Advising here at the University of Oregon. Uh, and I also have a fellow moderator, JC Berg, that's with me today, the college uh, events coordinator from Clark Honors College here at the university. Um, and so, you know, I just want to thank uh, all of our panelists that are here today for the amazing research that they have done. Um, and thank you to all of you in the audience, uh, both on Zoom and on YouTube as well. Um, so with all of that being said, I'll go ahead and turn it over to um, our first presenter, and that will be Anastasia Browning, who is a senior psychology major. And the, the topic of their research was leveraging evidence-based messaging to prevent the spread of COVID-19. All right, take it away, Anastasia. Thanks, Adam. Let me just share my screen. All right, so, um, give me one second. So as Adam said, um, my name is Anastasia Browning um, and I conducted my research, which is titled Leveraging Evidence-Based Messaging to, present, uh, to Prevent the Spread of COVID-19. Um, and I did my research under the mentorship of Dr. Elliot Berkman in the Social and Affective Neuroscience Lab um, with the support of the Center of Undergraduate Research and Engagement um, with their Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship. Um, so basically leveraging evidence-based messaging to prevent the spread of COVID-19, it's kind of a mouthful, but really what I was interested in looking at was our communications um, and how they translate to our actual intentions to follow our mitigation guidelines when COVID-19 came out. So um, if you remember during the early days of the COVID-19 crisis, we saw a rapid move to socially isolate. And I noticed kind of what felt like a self-protective uh, surge of thinking in America. All this was, of course, in an effort to um, protect ourselves, right, um, from this deadly virus. But all through this pandemic, three main points from the World Health Organization's constitution kept repeating in my head. And I felt they were important to emphasize here um, when we began. So the first is that the health of all peoples is fundamental to the attainment of peace and security, and it is dependent on the fullest uh, cooperation of individuals and states. The second is that the achievement of any state in the promotion and protection of health is of value to all. And the third is that informed opinion and active cooperation on the part of the public are of the utmost importance in the improvement of the health of the people. So in the early days of the pandemic, the CDC recommendations of social distancing were framed in what psychology calls avoidance terms, or um, <clears throat> focusing on protecting yourself against COVID-19 by avoiding contact with others. So COVID-19 here being a negative outcome that you want to avoid. I was concerned that these messages might cause an already distressing um, and traumatic situation to be compounded with negative feelings and stress. I was also concerned um, about the effectiveness of these messages, seeing as following them was quintessential to our success in mitigating the virus at the time. So many theories from psychology are actually really relevant to communication about our um, health behaviors. Scholars of motivation have long theorized that how one communicates the framing of your goals is expected to have a direct effect on the success and timely accomplishment of them. So they explain this in two ways. On one side, you have approach frame goals. So these are considered to be purpose-driven or active goals, uh, kind of motivated by the attainment of a desired positive outcome. So for instance, someone choosing to study super hard because she wants to become a psychologist. Uh, in the other direction, you have avoidance frame goals. 
These are explained as the avoidance of unwanted or negative outcomes. So for instance, um, someone who chooses to study really hard to avoid disappointing his parents. So this person is working to avoid an unwanted um, negative outcome. So another really wonderful theory um, in psychology related to health behavior change and motivation is self-transcendence theory. So self-transcendence self um, is described as a construct as the ability to transcend outside of individualistically bound perspectives by bringing to your conscious awareness um, the interconnectedness between yourself, the environment, and others. Um, and the theory of self-transcendence suggests that creating concern for the greater good can actually increase an individual's responsiveness to new input and promote healthy behavior change. So based on self-transcendence theory, together with approach avoidance theory, I decided to research whether reframing our government's COVID-19 preventative procedures using the concern for the well-being of others as the underlying goal, instead of protecting yourself as an individual, um, with an approach framing, might be able to uh, increase receptivity, intentions to follow protocols, positive affect, and self-transcendent attitudes, and also possibly decrease negative affect and self-reported levels of stress um, experienced during the COVID-19 pandemic. I also intended to test whether the effects uh, found within our model held while controlling for key demographics that we're showing to be uh, predictive of following our preventative guidelines, such as political affiliation and age. So um, I collected a total of 832 representative participants on April 14th of 2020 and random, randomly assigned them into four groups. In each group, participants viewed a virtual health pamphlet, which I adapted directly from CDC recommendations of mitigation protocols. Each pamphlet had either approach or avoidance framing and either self-protective or altruistic goals that were embedded within the messaging. So an example of wording within um, our experimental condition uh, would have been, even if you're not considered part of the population that um, is most vulnerable to the effects of COVID-19, your, particip your participation in following these protocols will have a direct effect on the lives of others or practice community care by giving others six feet of distance. Um, an example of our control group, which um, was wording again, taken directly from our government messaging was even if you're not considered part of the population that is most vulnerable to the effects of COVID-19, your participation in following these protocols will have a direct effect on protecting you from the threat of this pandemic or protect yourself by practicing social distancing and keeping six feet of distance between yourself and others. So immediately after viewing uh, the pamphlet, participants completed a set of self-report surveys where they shared with me their feelings, their perceptions, and their intentions after having read the health pamphlets. And finally, participants were given the option to donate to Feed America's COVID-19 Relief Fund. They could either donate all of their study earnings or none of their study earnings. So keep, they were offered to keep their study earnings if they wanted, there was no coercion. Um, and this was put in in hopes of capturing a behavioral measure um, of, the self, of their self-transcendent attitudes. So our results suggested that people in the altruistic conditions showed significantly greater intentions to follow mitigation guidelines than the self-protective conditions. We tested this, um, this difference between our groups using a Kruskal-Wallace non-parametric test as our primary outcome measures such as um, intentions to follow guidelines and stress. If you can see this was intentions, um, they were highly skewed during this non-normal pandemic event. Uh, greater intentions to follow guidelines were linked to older age, being non-male and having less secure employment. However, there remained a significant effect of goal orientation after having controlled for these uh, individual differences. There was no significant difference of intentions to follow mitigation procedures between the approach and avoidance message framing groups, however, um, and no significant interaction between framing and goal orientation. So in conclusion, I found these results highly concerning, um, seeing as the self-protective conditions, our control was most closely represented, uh, representative of the real world messaging that was being shared from our government at the time of testing. 
However, our results do contribute to the growing body of research that supports self-transcendence as a mechanism of self-regulation and behavior change, and that this mechanism holds during the current pandemic. Future research should focus on clarifying our understanding of self-transcendence and its influence on health-related motivation um, and behavior change. Specifically, research should attempt to test the transdiagnostic effects of self-transcendence because it seems to have a kind of wide scope of applicability when targeting changes in health behaviors. Further, research should assess whether self-transcendence enhances self-regulation um, and impacts health-related behavior change, more so for particular groups of people or if the effects hold regardless of individual differences. In support of the current literature, our findings suggested that self-transcendence uh, might indeed generate a sense of interconnectedness between generations. Um, we demonstrated this by influencing younger generations to follow COVID-19 preventative procedures, which may or may not have had a direct um, benefit to them. So barriers to preventing the continued spread of COVID-19 have arisen in the United States, um, in part due to politicizing of mask wearing and other protective practices. Ongoing research um, suggests that political affiliation is associated with an individual's intentions to follow COVID-19 preventative procedures in the United States. Um, but interestingly, um, our study suggested that intentions to follow guidelines are significantly um, affected when self-transcendent messaging is used within COVID-19 preventative communications. And again, even after controlling for key individual differences such as political affiliation. So research suggests that self-transcendence um, kind of influences a detachment from these external definitions of self. Um, and it can also like remove these hard lines that are created by separating the self from others. Um, and in fact, research does affirm that self-transcendence can lessen the negative effects of group exclusion and perceived threats to an individual's sense of self-worth. Um, arguably, this effect could explain why self-transcendent messaging would have an effect on intentions to comply with COVID-19 preventative procedures. Uh, even for those whose beliefs are contradictory to the expert evidence <laughs> um, suggesting their effectiveness. In an effort to address human complexity and behavior change and motivation, research should also address whether the effectiveness of our messaging translates, despite our individual differences, to, prom to promote adherence regardless of these identity politics. The success um, in identifying specific mechanisms such as these, um, like self-transcendence, uh, might influence the public's adherence to our mitigation guidelines, um, and that's very fundamental to our efforts. Um, it also would be interesting to test if this knowledge might translate um, to COVID-19 messaging, maybe regarding vaccine um, acceptance. Um, this is crucial for decreasing the burden on our healthcare workers and for decreasing our growing mortality rates. At the same time, this could allow for the safe reopening of states um, and the slow rebuilding of our economies. Um, so thanks, yeah, that's my research. Um, I really, really, really wanna again thank uh, my amazing mentor, Dr. Elliot Berkman, uh, Melissa Moss, uh, Megan Lipset, Bernice Chung and San Lab um, and the Center for Undergraduate Research and Engagement again for their fabulous support and uh, my, doing my research all this last year um, in the University of Oregon as well. So thank you so much, I'll stop sharing. And I'm not seeing any Q&A, so. Yeah, and yeah, thank you, Anastasia, for uh, sharing that that very timely research. And um, so just a reminder for the audience members, uh, remember that you can, if you do have questions uh, for Anastasia, you can submit those questions in the Q&A. Um, and again, we'll address those at the end of all the presentations today uh, when we have our Q&A time at the end. Um, so with that, we'll move on to our next presenter, and that is uh, Kenzie Hudler, and they are a senior uh, journalism public relations major, um, and the topic of their uh, research was media framing of second wave feminists and civil rights protest groups at the 1968 Miss America pageant. Um, so Kenzie, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I will share my screen right now. Awesome. Okay, hopefully 
It's loading. Okay, great. So yes, um, as Adam mentioned, my topic is media framing of second wave feminists and civil rights protest groups at the 1968 Miss America pageant, which I realize is a very niche topic, but it's actually really interesting once we get going. <laughs> um, let's see. There we go. So to give you a little bit of background on these two different protest groups that were protesting at the 1968 Miss America pageant. Um, so just outside the pageant, second wave feminists uh, from the New York radical women gathered for a theatrical demonstration with signs that read things like don't be a playboy accessory and welcome to the Miss America cattle auction to name a few. And protesters also crowned a live sheep to be Miss America, auctioned off a puppet-like figure that stood to represent Miss America herself, and threw feminine items into a freedom trash can. A few protesters also stormed into the actual pageant itself and held up a banner that read Women's Liberation, which did not make it the New York Radical Women represented the women's liberation feminist movement and mainly critiqued the Miss America pageant for its objectification and commoditization of women through unrealistic and hegemonic beauty standards. Um, days before the protest, one of the most involved protest organizers Besto, that outlined 10 specific points about what was wrong with Miss, um, the Miss America pageant. So, however, less media covered another protest that occurred just blocks away on the same exact day, which was the Miss Black America pageant. So female civil rights activists put together this peaceful demonstration to critique the Miss America pageant for its ethnocentric beauty standards and lack of diversity in winning contestants. Um, the Miss Black America pageant was an extension of the Black is Beautiful movement, which stood to dispel the notion that Black people's natural physical features are inherently less beautiful and rather they should be celebrated. So you'll see the natural juxtaposition of these protests that occurred near each other on the same day and in opposition to the same event. And this warrants a critical study of how mass media outlets portrayed these protests and the individuals behind them. Um, so with this in mind, it's important to convey a more holistic view of the intersectionality between the feminist and civil rights movements in the late 1960s, contrary to what mass media outlets have portrayed to date. So moving to the next slide, this is kind of just an overview of what my paper looked like. Um, I had a literature review which provided historical context for both the protest groups and the movements. So I gave you a brief introduction there, but my paper goes into way more depth about those. I published literature, um, previously published literature on media framing, and then my research questions, which I will go into in a second. My method, which was a qualitative content analysis of 10 different news articles, and the Up Against the Wall Miss America documentary from the Third World Newsreel, as well as my results and discussion and conclusions. So diving deeper into that, as you can read in my literature review, previous published literature asserts that journalists use information biases to frame information in news coverage, especially on controversial events such as protests, as Bennett writes in their 2003 paper. More specifically, the protest paradigm um, reflects how journalists focus on personal aspects of protesters and their violent actions rather than the more important and larger systemic issues at hand. Um, upon closer analysis, the goals of the New York Radical Women and the Miss Black America pageant contestants and organizers overlap more than mass media publications portrayed them to. So because of this failure to highlight the intersectionality between the two groups and their respective movements, mass media outlets often made it seem as if the New York Radical Women protest and the Miss Black America pageant were entirely separate and often in opposition to one another. So these separate and often opposing depictions of each protest resulted in greater divergence and fragmentation between the movements. Moving on to the media coverage of the 1968 events in Atlantic City, a group of feminist filmmakers directed a documentary entitled Up Against the Wall Miss America, which ended up being a critical piece in the second wave feminist movement that offered a unique perspective in comparison to mass media coverage of the events. So in other words, the documentary served as this feminist manifesto for the New York radical women as well. In regard to the Up Against the Wall Miss America documentary, it begins to address the intersectionality between the two groups and their respective movements. However, there's still a general deficit in literature that addresses this intersectionality and how the documentary highlights it, which is what my paper is going to do. 
So overall, previously published research lacks wide evidence and study of how media framing techniques were used to strategically position the protest groups in conflict or separate to each other, as well as how other media portrayals of said events, which is in this case, the Up Against the Wall Miss America documentary, may have differed from the narratives that mass media outlets presented. More specifically, few scholarly research articles discuss the intersectionality between the Miss Black America pageant and the New York Radical Women protest. However, even fewer analyze how media outlets strategically frame their missions as separate or in conflict with one another. With this in mind, there lies a gap in research in how mass media outlets used framing techniques to position each protest and its corresponding movement within public opinion. And my research attempts to fill this gap with my two main research questions. So for this particular study, I developed two research questions, um, which read as follows. How did different mass media outlets or publications use framing techniques in their portrayals of the protesters? And how did mass media portrayals differ from other media depictions of the protester movements, which in this case is the Up Against the Wall Miss America documentary? Um, so this study's findings will result from a comprehensive content analysis method to analyze mass media framing techniques used in national and local coverage on the Miss America pageant, the Miss Black America pageant, and the women's liberation protest. So with the help of subject and research librarians at the University of Oregon Libraries, I was able to locate specific articles that previously published literature had analyzed, and my qualitative content analysis involved taking a critical look at 10 different news articles from five different media publications, including including the Chicago Defender and the New York Times. And my finalized coding rubric featured questions covering the saliency of the article on the page, how the article might have been positioned in relation to the other related articles on the same page, what kind of images were used, things like that. So my findings, while from a small sample, provide a baseline of framing insights that potentially could inform future similar studies. And lastly, I conducted a content analysis of the Up Against the Wall Miss America documentary, which analyzed quotes that stood out from the audio, frames, and specific shots that stood out with layered audio. So now that I've described my methodology for my analysis, I'll get to the most exciting part, the results. Um, so moving on to the results, I'll first touch on the strategic article positioning. With article positioning, I found that often articles near or within each other told separatist narratives and offered opportunity for comparison. Um, for headlines, I found that strategic word choice identified certain groups as winners, others as sinister rivals, and some as victims, and others as enemies, which contributed to a sort of character development within these narratives as as told by the media. In terms of images used um, within the articles, Miss America 1969, Judith Ford, uh, was the most commonly featured, and the captions accompanying these images more often than not made her appear feminine and emotional, and Miss Black America to be less emotional and therefore more masculine, and the protesters were often portrayed to be radical and the least photographed. So when looking at the articles that covered the Miss Black America pageant, I found that framing techniques such as fragmentation and with word choice and selective quoting and personalization with focusing on key players of the protest rather than systemic racism within the pageant were used to diminish the effectiveness of the Black is Beautiful and women's liberation movements. So to the right is a direct quote from Sandra Williams, uh, Miss Black America, on the women's liberation protest, which Clemence Rude strategically included to further radicalize the New York radical women protest with alienating and dismissive language. If you want to take a second to look at that, she says they're expressing freedom, I guess. She said, to each his own, obviously dismissing the point of the women's liberation protest. So moving on to articles that covered the Miss America pageant, framing techniques were used to position the two protest groups against each other and separate in their fight against the Miss America pageant, and fragmentation was used with word choice, which radicalized the protest groups in comparison to the mainstream Miss America pageant. Lastly, within articles covering mainly the New York Radical Women protest, framing techniques were used to radicalize these protesters and diminish the feminist movement to the individual women involved. So dramatization was used with word choice, which can be reflected from the table to the right. Um, you'll see that one New York Times reporter used adjectives as serene and still unspoiled and popular to describe the Miss America pageant, while adjectives such as rude, radical, ferocious, and neurotic were used to describe the near radical women protesters. Um, and fragmentation was also used with selective quoting and the deliberate choice to not quote or mention Flo Kennedy, which was a, um, she was a very pivotal character in the Black is Beautiful movement who was actually at the New York radical women protests. So she was a really key part in that intersectionality. 
So the first thing I noticed about the Up Against the Wall documentary was that Black feminists were highlighted much more than in mass media coverage. So Flo Kennedy, who I just spoke about, is featured prominently throughout this film, which indicates her leading role in the New York Radical Women protest, contrary to what mass media publications portrayed. And what's key about her inclusion is that um, she really reflects that true intersectionality, as I was telling you. Um, separatist narratives as told by mass media publications purposefully left out Kennedy's involvement, which implies that black women are forced to choose between women's liberation and civil rights. In reality, the core values of these movements overlap more than one might think. And the documentary also comments on racism with roses. Um, that was a metaphor that the New York radical women came up with in their feminist manifesto, claiming that these women were quite literally being enslaved by American beauty standards. Um, yeah, so you'll see here there's lots of symbolism, power, very powerful symbolism in this documentary. Um, certain shots show this live sheep being crowned as Miss America on the boardwalk, and amusement park scenes layered with parade music reflect the kitsch and nostalgia that's often associated uh, with American traditions such as the Miss America pageant. So now I'll draw a few conclusions. Um, after conducting my qualitative analysis, I noticed three core media frames at play here. With legitimacy, more articles lent legitimacy to the mainstream Miss America pageant while simultaneously radicalizing the New York Radical Women and Miss Black America pageant. Um, second, mass media coverage definitely humanized some, usually Miss America herself, and dehumanized others, usually the feminist protesters and Miss Black America. And lastly, journalists had heavy influence on not only who was given how much of a voice, but also how to censor what that voice was saying. So to conclude, mass media outlets crafted this victim-based narrative that centered around Miss America herself being an individual victim that was attacked by angry and radical protesters. And these news articles trivialized the social reform efforts of feminism and racism to the personal identities of the key players at hand. And further, journalists also diffused and ignored any intersectionality between the two movements in telling this narrative. So lastly, in comparison to the Up Against the Wall documentary, the documentary offers a more holistic narrative of the women's liberation protest, as well as the intersectionality between the two groups. So ultimately with this study, um, I hope that my readers will not only gain a deeper understanding of how media framing techniques can be used to influence public opinion, but also develop a more informed lens when consuming news and analyzing media coverage on controversial topics. So that is it for my presentation. Thank you so much. And um, definitely do questions at the end, but I will stop sharing my screen now. All right. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Kenzie. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, we'll continue on to uh, Peyton Lommers now. And uh, Peyton is a planning uh, public policy and management major. And the title of their uh, presentation and their research is Matt and Diedrich, uh, White Saviors of the Gobi Desert. Uh, take it away, Peyton. Hello. Uh, thank you, Adam, for the introduction. And um, let me just uh, share my screen and get started. Um, all right. So um, I will be talking about uh, Nadam Kashmir and some of the, the claims that they have made and the, um, the accuracy of those claims. So here we go. Oh, so you'd have to be stupid or crazy to end up in the middle of the Gobi Desert with two and a half million dollars in cash. These guys were a bit of both. This is a quote from one of the advertisements that Nadam Kashmir um, released recently about how their um, about their their story and the way they went to the Gobi Desert to buy up all of the cashmere and um, at manufacture sweaters. So the guys in question are Matthew Scanlan and Diedrich Riesemus, um, the co-founders of Nadam Kashmir, credited with being, quote, the only company in the world who's created a premium 100% cashmere sweater for just $75. In 2015, Diedrich asked his former college roommate, Matt, if he wanted to take a trip to Mongolia. Matt agreed and they spent about a month in the Gobi Desert with a group of local goat herders and a man named Jay Ulzibodiov, also known as Bodio. Bodio is both the founder of the Gobi Revival Fund and the owner of Bodio's Mongolia Corporation, a wool supplier based in the Bayangovi region. Bodio became close friends with Matt and Diedrich during their month together, so much so that Matt and Diedrich decided to do something to make life better for the people in Mongolia. 
To accomplish this, they planned on buying up all the cashmere wool from all the goat herders in the area in order to make high quality cashmere sweaters that they could sell in the United States. They also plan to use the profits from this business to give back to the people of the Bayangobi region through the Gobi Revival Fund. Nadam goes straight to the source of the world's best cashmere, Mongolia's Gobi Desert, and works directly with herders to bring you high quality, sustainable, and unbelievably soft knitwear at prices that are fair for them and for you. That is Nadam's mission statement, claiming to provide sustainable cashmere while paying fair wages to workers throughout their supply chain. In their advertisements, Nadam claims that they have one, constructed a local park, two, planted 2,000 trees, three, constructed over 30 miles of fencing, four, inocula inoculated over 1 million goats, and finally, they also claim to maintain a well in Bayangovi, which provides water to more than 700 families. As you'll soon see, these claims are false. Nadam's supply chain is mostly comprised of herders and factory workers. According to Nadam's annual impact report, about 90% of our 2019 product was made at two key suppliers in Chifang who were audited against the Business Social Compliance Initiative Framework. The Business Social Compliance Initiative, or BSCI, only requires compliant businesses to, quote, pay wages mandated by government's minimum wage legislation. Chifang is located in the province of Inner Mongolia, China. The minimum wage of Inner Mongolia is 18.6 yuan per hour. The BSCI also specifies that in most circumstances, employees will not be required to work more than 48 hours per week. Converting 18.6 yuan to USD and accounting for the maximum of 48 work hours per week, employees working in the factories that produce Nadam's products can be expected to receive about 550 USD per month or just 6,600 USD per year. The living wage in Chifeng is not as readily available as the minimum wage. However, the living wage in Mongolia for a single person with rent is about 680 USD per month or 8,160 USD per year. This means the monthly minimum wage in Chifeng is about 125 USD lower than the monthly living wage for a single person with rent. Clearly, Nadam is not holding their suppliers to as high of a standard as their advertisements would have you believe. Their suppliers in Chifeng are not expected to pay their workers a living wage, even when audited by third parties against BSCI requirements. The Gobi Revival Fund is a non-governmental organization or NGO based in the Bayangovi region of Mongolia. It is a nonprofit which, which seeks to support local residents living in the Bayangovi region. It was founded by J. Ulsi Bodiaf or Bodio in 2001. Nadam mentions a series of nonprofits in their advertisements. Those ads are referring to the Gobi Revival Fund. Nadam's claims about the park, planting trees, building fences, inoculating goats, and the maintaining of a well are all referring to projects they have undertaken in collaboration with Bodio and the Gobi Revival Fund. Their first claim is that Nadam built a park in Bayangovi Sum, Sum means village in Mongolian, with sitting areas, a garden, and an irrigated soccer field as a gathering, as a gathering area for the community as well as for tourists. On the surface, this seems generous. However, an important question to ask here would be whether this park was truly built in an effort to strengthen the community of Bayangovi Sum or built solely for the advertising benefits it provides for the Nadam Corporation. In an interview for Star TV conducted in 2015, Bodio talks about his hopes for the future of the village where he grew up, Bayangovi Sum. He describes a youth center with, quote, a nice theater, sport hall, library, workshop, and an art shop. If you have a nice youth center organizing these kinds of things, you can help kids figure out the next step. Bodio dreams of a place to help the people of his village follow their passions. It seems that this project is what sparked the idea for Nadam to fund a park. Unfortunately, the project did not have the intended impact for local residents. Building an irrigated sporting field with a seating area was never a request of Bayangovi Sum. This appears to be nothing more than a talking point for Nadam advertisements, as well as a potential hotspot for tourism. Planting more than 2,000 trees in the Bayangovi region would have a much more substantial impact on the well being of local residents than a sports field. For many years, Bayangovi Sum has been plagued by dust storms and severe droughts. These are the perfect ingredients for desertification. However, there are ways to slow and even reverse desertification altogether. For example, the roots of plants help hold soil in place and prevent erosion, while the long taproots of trees can bring water from deep below ground much closer to the surface. This makes the endeavor of planting trees a noble one. However, Nadam has failed to follow through on such an endeavor. In the Mongola Aid featurette, Stand Up for the Gobi, the governor of Bayangovi Sum is interviewed about the effect the new well has had on the community. Quote, to reduce the dust and ease the soil erosion, we've begun planting trees using our well. 
So far, we have over 2,000 trees. This statement implies that the initiative of planting over 2,000 trees was an act of the public sector of buying Govi. As this interview is from 2015, Matt and Diedrich were only just touring the village. This means these trees were not, in fact, the result of support from Nadam. Nadam also claims to have fenced in, quote, an area the size of Manhattan in the Mongolian rangeland in order to contain the Kashmir goats during a portion of the year and help prevent desertification. However, the only foolproof method to help prevent desertification in Mongolia is to reduce herd size of Mongolian livestock. This simply cannot occur if Nadam's corporate growth and the growth of the Kashmir industry as a whole demands more Kashmir wool year over year. Nadam claims to have inoculated more than 1 million goats in order to create herds that are more resistant to disease. This project is helping herders in Mongolia economically. Disease resistant livestock means more Kashmir wool being produced year over year. And in this, in this case, more Kashmir means more money in the pockets of goat herders. There's still one very important party in this story. Mongola Aid is an Australian based nonprofit founded by Barry Jiggins whose mission is to help support communities in the Gobi Desert through donations of blankets and shoes and through projects such as the Buy and Gobi Water Project. Bodio, founder of the Gobi Revival Fund, also owns a Mongolian touring company as a hobby. Mongola Aid was founded after Barry Jiggins toured Mongolia with Bodio in 2003. Barry Jiggins loved the country and saw that many people living in the Gobi Desert were living in less than ideal conditions. He founded Mongola Aid to help raise the quality of life in Mongolia as well as restore the Mongolian landscape and ecosystem. Mongola Aid has successfully implemented myriad programs, but its most ambitious is the Bayangovi Water Project. This project sought to bring clean water to Bayangovi Sum, a community that has long suffered from kidney and liver diseases associated with consumption of unclean water. To accomplish this, Barry Jiggins and Mongola Aid partnered with Bodio and the Gobi Revival Fund to dig a well near Bayangovi Sum and pipe the resulting water 1,650 meters into the town. This well cost about $110,000 in USD and Barry Jiggins paid for it from his own life savings. This water is being used to drink, shower and grow plants which help prevent and even reverse the desertification process. In their annual impact report, Nadam claims to quote, help maintain a well in Bayangovi that provides a clean and secure source of drinking water to over 700 families. They are overstating their role in this project. This well was the result of Barry Jiggins and Bodio's work and sacrifice. According to Barry Jiggins, Nadam Kashmir had nothing to do with our collaboration. They may have had dealings with the Gobi Revival Fund afterwards, but I am not aware of any water project involving them personally. I had to reach out to Barry Jiggins personally to understand his impact on the communities of the Gobi Desert in its entirety. If I hadn't, I would never have discovered that he paid for the Gobi water, the buying Gobi water project out of his own pocket. This is to say that Barry Jiggins does not advertise his role in charitable work. By contrast, Nadam seems to exclusively advertise its charitable work and forego the execution of it. They heavily advertise to the American public about all the ways they are helping strengthen the communities of the Gobi Desert, when in reality, their contributions have been minimal. The phenomenon of white people traveling to foreign countries and exploiting the local labor and resources has become widespread enough to require a name to refer to it. The story of Nadam's founders perfectly exemplifies this concept. Matt and Diedrich traveled to Mongolia and decided to save the locals by buying up all their cashmere wool. They created a narrative where they are the heroes fighting against a system of oppression in order to sell sweaters to socially conscious Americans. In reality, the only living wages they're paying are to the 40 employees in their corporate office in New York. Matt and Diedrich fully embraced the pervasive corporate culture in America, which, domestic, which prioritizes domestic wokeness over foreign aid. Slum tourism is a controversial practice which dates back to 19th century Manhattan and London. Since then, this practice has only grown featuring affluent tourists, affluent tourists, usually from European countries, touring slums all over the world. Nadam was founded after Matthew Scanlon and Diedrich Riesemus toured the Bayangovi region with Bodio. Similarly, Mongola Aid was founded after Barry Jiggins toured the same region with the same tour guide. Both of these instances exemplify the hallmarks of slum tourism. These examples are important because slum tourism has many proponents and opponents. On one hand, slum tourism can lead to rich white people exploiting the citizens of other nations, as with Nadam's behavior in Mongolia and China. And on the other hand, slum tourism can lead to rich white people truly seeing the conditions other people live in, and as a result, starting helpful charitable organizations, such as with Barry Jiggins' founding of Mongola Aid. 
In a perfect world, it wouldn't be necessary for rich people to tour slums in order to exhibit empathy, many times at the cost of the dignity of the residents of those slums. However, if that's what it takes to build a well in the middle of the Gobi Desert, then perhaps slum tourism also has an upside. The idea that Nadam's cashmere is 100% sustainable is an advertising ploy and nothing more. Cashmere goats in particular have traits which make their industry more likely to cause desertification and overall become less sustainable. They eat plants down to the root and trample plants with their sharp hooves, meaning after they graze in an area, plants do not return in that area the following year. In an interview with Fashionista, Patagonia Senior Manager of Materials Innovation and Development, Sarah Hayes, had this to say. I think in a perfect world, cashmere would be produced responsibly with the right amount of goats for the right amount of land, reverting back to the way cashmere used to be sold as a true luxury item where it's very high quality fiber, carefully raised, carefully produced, and yielding in product that lasts forever. The solution here is to use less cashmere. With that said, the absolute worst thing to do would be to say, start selling a cashmere sweater for the reasonably low price of $75. Nadam is actively contributing to the problematic nature of this industry. So you'd have to be stupid or crazy to end up in the middle of the Gobi Desert with two and a half million dollars in cash. These guys were a bit of both. Matthew Scanlan and Diedrich Riesemus are not stupid or crazy. They're opportunistic businessmen. They know that the American public, especially the younger generations are becoming more socially conscious. The average middle-class American wants to know that their apples are organic, that their diamonds are non-conflict, and that their cashmere sweaters are, quote, high quality, sustainable, and fair for the herders. That is what makes Nadam's advertisements so brilliant. They show two guys from New York who fell in love with the country and its people and decided to help them out. They would have you believe they single-handedly saved the poor herders of Mongolia, but they omit the contributions of others. Matt and Diedrich are playing the role of white saviors whose virtues are signaled to their consumers through their advertisements. It is disingenuous, but extremely effective. These guys are not stupid or crazy, but because of herders in Mongolia and factory workers in China, they are stupid, crazy rich. Um, so that was my presentation. Um, thank you for listening. And right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Peyton. Um, and so now we will move forward to uh, Carolyn Roderick, who is a journalism and uh, political science major. And the title of their research was Media and Science, a Case Study of CTE. Awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, let me pull up. Okay. Um, so today as introduced, um, my topic is uh, CTE. And um, so basically I chose this topic um, because of my general interest. Um, I started looking into it for a class and I noticed that, you know, I had so many misconceptions and I didn't really understand it the way I thought I did. So um, my research goal and my research question uh, was to sort of compile a lot of information of like, why do we hold these? How do we end up with these misconceptions? Um, so I kind of, I did basically a, a literature review and I compiled several different ideas to try to get a big picture of my topic. Um, so part of this, so part of the obvious thing is a bias. Um, so researchers and journalists are also susceptible, are very susceptible to biases, and I think we have to consider bias potentially in researchers. So um, one of the examples I'm giving uh, is PBS Frontline. Uh, they had examined several players that may potentially have had CTE, and they reported a number of 96%. However, um, a lot of the articles talking about it downplayed uh, selection bias. So the number 96% was made public and people may now still associate 96% with CTE um, when our real number is closer to about 32%. Um, so another example is the MBTI committee created by the NFL um, after having a bit of scrutiny related to this topic. Um, and they started publishing articles very quickly that got a lot of media attention. Um, and without acknowledging sort of the incentive 
that the MBTI committee had, it was easy to downplay the existence. So we see bias going both ways and without acknowledging bias in researchers, um, it's fairly easy to see how misconceptions can be created. Uh, so these are some specific biases that affect both researchers and reporters. So um, generally a lot of the themes we see here are our rejection of new information, you know, kind of the, oh, it must be this when research is not necessarily pointing in that direction. Um, so also we see biases in publishing. So a study that finds a really high number or finds um, that has positive findings is more likely to be reported. Um, emotional events obviously get the attention of the public pretty quickly. Uh, so that can also affect um, our idea of what the prevalence is. So some of the solution to these biases um, is not just to put the burden on reporters, but I think it's very important to create collaboration between researchers and reporters, sharing knowledge and being able to understand because the writing styles that you're looking at are very different and being able to share knowledge. Um, so headlines are another part of this. I think a lot of people have talked about headlines in their research as well, but um, one of the studies I examined um, found that, you know, a lot of times things that aren't necessarily connected are connected through headlines. So like the idea of concussion, it's a misconception that con concussions cause CTE when any sort of head trauma or even body trauma can cause it. Um, and then frequency of reporting and news titles. So mentions of it, is it has increased, but as it has increased, um, there's kind of this pattern of spikes and decreases. And while awareness has increased, uh, the spikes and decreases has been, okay, we're paying attention. Okay, but now we're ignoring it, but then we're gonna pay attention and then we're gonna ignore it. So that causes, you know, it's harder to really work on issues that may exist when we're only paying attention to them for a short time. Um, and also uh, scientific debate is more likely to be covered than consensus. So, you know, that may create doubts in the public that scientists aren't necessarily holding. And then I think a lot of people in their, in their research have also mentioned framing. Um, so a couple of the sort of frames that go together are episodic versus thematic. So a lot of times um, CTE was portrayed as, you know, single issues such as deaths of players, violent acts committed by players that likely had the disease. Um, and when we frame these things as singular events, it makes it a lot harder to kind of see a big picture and to see a pattern and to really work on things like this. Um, and then another big one I wanna highlight is the idea of false balance. So I think as reporters, a lot of us are taught to give equal, to kind of balance our reporting and to give equal sides merit. But with science, that's not always true. It's usually one way or the other, like, um, and yeah. Okay, and then I think media also has a place in perpetuating a lot of the culture of sport, the walk it off, the, you know, I, players are often praised and viewed as sort of expendable. Um, so one of the examples I highlighted was the NFL's top 10 gutsiest performances where they praised players for ignoring, ignoring their own injuries. Um, and some of the studies I examined show, did show a changing narrative. However, you know, a lot of people, there are challenges to the culture that are happening and they're not really getting much attention for those challenges. Um, and there are a lot of other factors that honest, I personally didn't know and I think a lot of people don't know, um, such as the contracts that players sign. Um, so basically how it works is, you know, if a player is benched a lot, uh, they often, uh, the coach can cancel their contract. So they'll do things such as falsify cognitive scores so that they appear normal when they're concussed. And they're more likely to hide their injuries because of this contract, because if they don't, they're likely to lose job security. And um, another piece is like the social responsibility. You know, why, do, why does this matter? Um, and I think it's important 
to apply accuracy to all parts. I think it's important as sports journalists to acknowledge a culture that exists. Um, and a lot of people are affected by the coverage they read. And most people are not going out and seeking scientific studies to just read. A lot of people get their information through media. So I think it's important that we look for accuracy as much as possible. And then this is kind of everything I use if anyone's interested. All right, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, so now all our presenters have presented. So now is the time of our session today where we can kind of transition into some Q&A. Did I see any uh, questions in our Q&A so far? Um, but again, for those of you that are in the audience, um, you can feel free to, you know, post your questions that you have uh, for a specific presenter or questions that you have for uh, the group as a whole. Um, and while we're maybe waiting for some of the audience to chime in with some questions, um, I'll maybe throw out a few questions to our group today. Um, and so just to kind of start off, uh, for each of you, um, could you maybe tell us a little bit more about how you became interested in the research topic that you selected and, and kind of how you got involved with it? I can start if we want to go in order. Um, yeah, I mean, so um, I was about to start um, pulling together a research question when the pandemic hit for a thesis. <laughs> Um, and uh, when when the when COVID nineteen hit, it became pretty apparent that people were going to either having to like readjust their whole concept of how to perform research um, without outside of the lab, um, or just you know put it on pause and hope that it didn't last too long. But um, I was sitting there just kind of trying to figure out what to do. But more so than that, I was just kind of like, well aside from the thesis, like, what can I do to help? Like, hey, I'm like in this research environment um, and I'm noticing things that I've learned through um, school that um, are teaching me that some of the communications I'm seeing are maybe not the most effective. And it kind of like was one of those gut things where I was like, this doesn't look good. I don't know, maybe we should be more thoughtful about this. Um, and so I just, it was like, it was like a ding and I was, I decided to go and research that. Um, so yeah, it was just like a, a series of events that led to my, my choice and research topic. Awesome. Um, I chose to do my research topic because I took a, an honors college class with Peter Alalunis. I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with him as a professor, but he is amazing. And it was a top cinema manifestos class. It was really cool. We watched movies all the time and a lot of them made no sense, but there was this one that was a documentary um, and it was the Up Against the Wall Miss America documentary I was talking about and it kind of stood out to me. So I did more research on it and then I did my final page paper on it. It was supposed to be eight pages most, like at most. And I wrote 14 because I was so interested in the topic and I kind of just ran with that. And I I had to find a way to make it related to my major for my honors program through my major. So I decided to do media framing because there was definitely a story to be told there. Um, and then I found out that it was something that not a lot of people were talking about. So I thought that that was uh, a cool topic to do my research on. Yeah, so um, the way I got into my research is I was watching some YouTube video and uh, an ad for Nadam's sweaters came up, basically bragging about the, how they had $75 sweaters, but they also somehow paid workers fair wages and did all this charitable stuff. Um, and I kind of was wondering to myself, like that doesn't, that doesn't sound possible. So I did some, some quick Googling and the, the Googling led to more lengthy research Googling and, um, and that was how I got into my research. Um, I guess my idea, um, I started getting interested actually in a high school AP psych class, which um, for me, it was not that long ago. Um, and I had to pick a topic for a writing class I took this year. So I um, decided to look further into that interest. And I just sort of realized like, 
wow, I have a lot of the wrong ideas about this topic. So I think I wanted to explore where those kind of came from and like how to do better. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you all for sharing. And um, again, I'm, I'm still, I don't think I'm seeing uh, questions in our Q&A. So I'll, I'll just kind of keep asking some, some of my own questions. So, um, uh, oh, is there, a, is there something? No, I have a question. Oh, well. okay. Yeah, yeah. Go for it. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> for, for everyone, because the, the, the kind of common theme um, of everyone's presentation centers around how, how these stories are all framed in the media and how, uh, you know, representation and, and uh, can, can change perception. And so my question to everyone really is, is what would you do or what would you suggest to solve the problem or a way to fix the problem that is evidently, <laughs> from all the evidence you just presented, existing? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I feel like all of our topics uh, probably address this in different ways, but I think from uh, the, the uh, social science end, I think, I mean, communication, just period, instead of just like thoughtful communication, but communication is important. And, you know, there is a lot of research out there about um, communication and uh, motivation and how communicating goals, that, again, can affect um, our accomplishment of them, our desire to achieve them. And um, so that's out there already, but uh, I think like not a lot of people know to like when they're presenting things, especially to the public in such a way to um, tie into this research and, and pull in effective messaging like that um, to be more persuasive or more um, inclusive, or, you know, there's a lot of problems with not feeling included in our communications, right? So there's ways of trying to, um, make it more more effective and inclusive and i think it starts with us talking about it in um you know not just in our scientific journals but with each other and with policymakers and um in these government agencies like the cdc so they're aware that they can do that better and that actually does have a significant effect on the outcome that they're trying to achieve so i think yeah just practicing better science communication in general would be a good thing yeah, I would say to answer that question for my research, um, it definitely would have been more beneficial and painted a more holistic picture of these two movements and the intersectionality between them if they had interviewed more informed members, more Black feminists that were caught between the two and made you know the media portrayed as if they were having to choose between the two. And I think that portraying it more as... Um, these things together and united in their fight against Miss America together would have painted a more accurate picture and less divisive and separatist and um, kind of opposing, pitting these two groups of women together where it didn't need to happen. Yes, yeah, so um, for my research, um, I, I see for Nadam specifically two different solutions and that would be either um, stopping their advertisements that claim to do all these charitable things or actually using their money to do those charitable things. Um, but industry-wide, like the entire cashmere industry, the, the solution here is to make cashmere products more expensive. Um, and that way there will be less cashmere produced and um, there, will, there will be less strain on the environment of places that raise cashmere wool. Um, yeah, I think a lot of my solutions would align uh, with Anastasia's. Um, I think it's important to create um, sort of more of a community between scientists and reporters because the style of writing is so different and just trying to get the basic facts across in a way that everyone can understand. And I think part of our problem is that we don't have like science reporters anymore. We just kind of have like you over there. <laughs> like, So I think just having more like training and understanding a lot of what goes into research would really help. All right, uh, JC, do you have another question or I, I can jump in with another one? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll jump in. 
Um, so I, I guess um, I'm curious for, for each of you, um, when you were doing your research, uh, did you come across any challenges? And if so, um, how did you overcome those challenges during your research process? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there are a lot of challenges. It was a challenging year for sure, you know, um, and but I think in the research process in general, it was just a, a adapting my understanding of how to conduct research in a more remote fashion was one. Um, but it actually proved um, um, pretty, you know, standard people are, are doing a lot of a lot more research remotely and it's been um, highly successful and that's been great to learn. Right. So it's an, kind of an adaptation that I I gained from that. Um, also, there's like all these really fun steps of being an undergraduate researcher where you don't have like total skills to do certain things, especially on the science level, doing analysis, um, learning how to code, like all these, all these things that you kind of learn as you go. You're like in the courses while you're, you're like actually performing the analyses. And it's just it's definitely a different timeline than I think um, graduate research. And so, um, yeah, it was challenging just because it was all very novel, but um, now, now I feel like I, I am so much more prepared. And so it was a really priceless learning lesson along the way. Yeah, I would say my biggest challenge was, I wasn't even really a challenge, but it was something I was disappointed about was with COVID. I couldn't go in and look at these newspaper articles that I was analyzing. And one of my favorite things to do with research is go in and look at these like older publications. And it's kind of cool to see newspapers from the sixties and just kind of sift through them. And that's something I enjoy doing. And I didn't get to do that with COVID and it was all online. And although that's easier, sometimes I think I missed out on that aspect of it. And then also you, I'm sure you guys can relate, but balancing working on a thesis with work and class and just having a life was also a challenge for me too, but we did it. Yeah, so um, the first challenge that I came across was actually um, a language barrier. All of a lot of the the research that I was doing on the the Gobi Revival Fund and its work in Mongolia was in Mongolian, which was um, a challenge for sure. Google Translate definitely helped there, but there were still some kind of weird uh, grammatical things to piece together. And then after that, it was really just trying to piece together. The contributions of all these different players and how they interacted with each other um, and so those, those were probably the biggest challenges for me. Um, I think my biggest challenge was like I've said a couple times in the seminar um, I'm one of the younger people here so it was uh, my first time doing actual research so I think you know being able to like learn how to do everything at the same time and like how do I like create like new knowledge with like what I with the resources I have as a brand new researcher and I think being able to like find the amount of focus on my topic like being able to how do I zoom in enough to a particular topic but how do I zoom out enough to get the full picture great yeah thank you and um just another thing that I'm curious about um you know, since we do have people here today, as well as, you know, people who will maybe watch this session in the future as well, um, who might be considering, you know, doing some research themselves. Um, I'm curious for you all now that you've gone through this research process. Uh, I mean, other than just the, you know, the information that you learned, what do you feel like is maybe like the biggest takeaway that you have from this process? And also what would be your advice to, you know, people who are considering, you know, getting involved in research in the future? Yeah, um, I would say my advice um, is definitely look into accessing the resources that the university provides for undergraduate researchers. Um, again, I was um, a summer undergraduate research fellow um, with the Center for Undergraduate Research and Engagement. Um, and that center in itself um, has like a bunch of different um, programs and um, ways to get involved. There's the ASUO as well, who is there to help support you. The library, <laughs> everyone, all of the like, just life-saving humans at the library um, are there to help with anything from how to just conduct your first steps in research, doing lit reviews, to analysis, to coding again, which I had to do and they helped with a lot. 
Um, yeah, so I, I would just say my advice is go with the, re the resources. I feel like if I was gonna tell anybody who hasn't done research as an undergraduate yet, I would just say definitely do do it because there's nothing like actually actually performing the stuff that you're learning um, as opposed to just like learning it and like regurgitating it, but actually like doing it. It's like, it's the same as kind of teaching something. It just facilitates the learning of how to do it so much more. So, yeah. Yeah, I would say that for me, the most rewarding part was just seeing my work come to fruition and seeing that I did this project. And usually, you know, you read other people's papers and you read these authors research. And for me to actually have my name on something like that was really, really cool. And I actually work for the library. So it was fun to work with some of my coworkers and um, like, they were so helpful in my process and helping me find research. And so that was really, really cool to experience. And I would say that it's, um, U of O has a really unique way of encouraging undergraduates to come up with original research and they provide a lot of resources for them. So I think that's really great. I admire that. Yeah. So, um, one thing I would say to any undergraduates who haven't done research yet is that it can be really fun to try to um, to like find all the pieces to your research and try to like fit them together. It's almost kind of like puzzle solving, um, which I really liked about this project. And um, one piece of advice that I would give is don't be afraid to like contact the the big players in these research projects that you're doing because sometimes they'll get back to you and that can be the most interesting part of the research. Um, I, I actually had some email correspondence with Barry Jiggins from Mongola Aid, and that was probably the, the best part of the research by far. Um, I think for any first time researchers, I would say lean on your faculty mentors. Um, like my professor for the writing class I took, I probably spent so many hours just like in office hours asking my questions. And I think, you know, those people are there to help you and like let them kind of like help you and guide you towards where you're supposed to be. All right. Well, yeah, I'm still looking at the Q&A, but uh, I'm curious um, for each of you all, as you were kind of viewing um, the other presentations today, did you have any questions for some of our other presenters? I don't really have questions. I just want to say that everyone's work is like very unique and super wonderful. Um, I was just going to say, uh, Carolyn, did you know there's a brain injury group here on campus? Um, I didn't know. Yeah, I'm actually involved in it. So I was super interested in your work, but it's called Synapse. You should look into it because I think the, the CT, especially since we're such a, a football forward school, is a really important topic to kind of put out there. That's really cool. All right, uh, JC, any other uh, thoughts or questions? Looking down at my notes that I wrote down, <laughs> but I think we've, we've kind of already, oh, I had one question for Anastasia uh, with the, um, the incentive for the Feed America. Did anybody actually donate? Unfortunately not. It was it was a non non significant finding, um, which there's you know a couple of different ways you can think about that. One is that this is because it's on Amazon's MTurk. This is an actual work earning that they were making, so that might have changed their their um, willingness to donate. The other thing is there's this there's a lot of stuff in research about an intention and behavior gap. So like, do our intentions totally lead to um, our actual behaviors. This, again, by the way, the Feeding America was on our self-transcendent attitudes, not necessarily our intentions to actually do the mitigation things. So, so those are two separate um, variables. But um, there is in the self-transcendence research, they kind of suggest that um, that if you use a more, um, sorry, not in the self-transcendence research, it's in other research, but they suggest in the intention behavior gap research that 
um, if you are doing a, a, a wording of something that is a more um, health protective as opposed to um, like a health risk that sometimes the intention behavior gap is smaller for those so it actually leads to better um, better following of behaviors after saying you're intending to do something so yeah so there's stuff that suggests that um, it should it should be there but it didn't with that one <laughs> unfortunately and especially during the crisis it was like come on guys <laughs> a little bit just a little bit all right so it looks like we do have an audience question and uh this goes out to all of our uh presenters slash panelists today so they're curious to hear from you all um you know for kind of building off the research that you've done uh, what might be next for you in terms of research and, and also um, how might it relate to like your future career path or, or future plans? Yeah, so I'm interested in clinical health psychology. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in, in self regulation and motivation and um, the social determinants, uh, psychosocial determinants of our health outcomes. So um, influencing ways um, within prevention science and intervention science to prevent negative health outcomes, but also our, our adjustment to these chronic diseases um, and disabilities. So um, influencing how, um, how we adjust psychologically to um, negative health outcomes. Um, so it's related um, to this, this was more in the messaging side, but there's many different ways that you can use prevention science, right? You can use it within um, how you communicate about um, how to prevent disease. You can communicate it um, within just our actual interventions. Um, you can also um, target things that are more psychological and social um, that are mechanisms that promote our following um, prevent preventative um, interventions and um, yeah, so I'm looking more into to that side of the health, um, and I'm hoping to get a PhD in clinical psych. Yeah, so in terms of this research, this kind of might be the end of the road for this spe specific project I've been working on, but um, I am going into the public relations field, and research is a really big part of successful public relations, so I will be doing it all the time, every day. It just won't exactly look like this, but um, I have definitely understood the value of research as I've uh, sharpened my PR skills, for sure. Yeah, um, for me uh, and for this research project, um, uh, I've, I've been seeing a lot of advertisements since starting this project that do a very similar thing to Nadam. They talk about all the great things they do. And it just, it makes me curious about um, the, the accuracy of their claims as well. Um, and I don't think I'll, I'll do a formal research project of any of them, but it, it, it makes me wonder. And um, in terms of my career, I, they probably, are not related. I'm I'm hoping to, to go into the the government sector. Um, and then I may continue to pursue um, science research. I know there's a lot of great opportunities in the SOJC um, that I'm looking into, um, and I think science is really interesting. So I think it'll be um, there. Can, there's a lot more that can be researched. Um, and then I think in terms of career path, um, I'm really interested in like political science and like reporting and policy and like just people. Um, so I think that's definitely something I could see myself going towards. <laughs> Luckily, I'm like a lot of people here, I've got a few years to work on that. All right, well, unless we have another um, question pop up in the Q&A. It, it kind of seems like that's a, a fitting way to maybe close out our session today. Um, but once again, uh, thanks to everyone who's attending the session now, as well as to those who are watching this session in the future. Um, and especially thanks to all our presenters today. And, you know, great job, all of you on your research and your presentations today. Um, so yeah, thanks again to everybody. And um, yeah, I think that's what we'll call it a wrap. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.